Am I allowed to say that you have a giant child or no? What are the rules here? Pretty, I don't know if he's, it depends on your standards of giant. He's big. He's a big boy. I don't know if he's giant. I wouldn't say giant. I, I, I don't mean that pejoratively, except on this TikTok, which I don't know if Dan has any idea what we're talking about. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? What's Dan doing over there? I'm, I don't know. I'm uh, texting. I'm, no, I'm reading. I'm, Mr. Oh, I'm so addicted to this device. I'm reading the stories that we're talking about. That's what I'm doing. I appreciate you studying for the test while taking the test. So I, what I want to know is is not just is Mina familiar with this uh, Minnesota tiny mom with big babies who went viral. It is not for the weak. I don't know if I'm just weak or my babies are just chunky, but... I wanted to know, has the thought already crossed her mind that her kid might play football? 100%. Yeah. Um, it's so my husband, every now and then, he's much more like idealistic and, you know, uh, I'm the pragmatist in our relationship. He'll be like, Do you, do, the other day, he was like, You know, oh, do you ever worry that our, our son might be bullied? And I looked at him and I was like, Nick, he will be the bully. Like, how have you not processed this? Our gigantic <laughs> son is going to be a jock. He's huge and strong. To put it in perspective, he's five months and he's over 20 pounds. Laura Rutledge, who hosts NFL Live, her kid is like, I think, eight or nine months. They're the same size. The Asian population needs a giant baby to save us when it comes to representation. We sports. really do. I know parents are annoying because they always like to say their kids are advanced. I am not saying my son is advanced mentally. <laughs> I'm saying he's <laughs> advanced physically. <laughs> physically. I want to start with this Caleb Williams story and the story about parenting um, because Kaylin Collar at The Athletic um, has this story uh, from late last month that sort of helped explain what was happening where Mina was at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis because Caleb Williams not doing stuff there wound up being an enormous story in a way that spoke, Dan, to topics that you've been covering and talking about forever. Caleb Williams is believed to be the first invitee to the scouting combine to decline to participate in the medical exams. For the medical stuff, I'll be doing the medical stuff, just not here in Indy. I'll be doing it at the team interviews. Um, you know, not 32 teams can draft me. Uh, there's only one of me. Um, and so uh, the teams that I go to for my visit, um, you know, those teams will have the, the medical and, and, and that'll be it. What is that player uh, supposed to do when he actually recognizes the power that he has, or at least has a dad who might be a person who listened to the Dan Lebetard show. Because when I look at this story and like, why is it that Caleb Williams is not doing stuff that many quarterbacks throughout time have done? It all goes back for the athletic and various reporting to his dad, Carl Williams. And Carl, I mean, Carl Williams' takes on stuff they are right out of, if you've been listening to any of the three of us talk about sports, it's like, why is there a draft? A draft is unjust. What about the rookie wage scale? The rookie wage scale is unjust. Um, these deadlines, medical testing, all of this stuff. Carl is the guy, seemingly behind the guy. And I guess, Mina, just you were there in Indy. Like, how much of this story feels to you like a revolution or something else? Because it feels big to me. If there's a revolutionary aspect to it, or if there's any sort of sea change, I would say this coming from Indy, it's the fact that this has transcended Caleb Williams. None of the top three quarterbacks did much at the combine. Heck, Jane Daniels wasn't measured, uh, but none of them did the throwing drills. Caleb, um, I believe, you know, his statement on that he didn't do medicals for every team because the reasoning was, well, not every team's going to have a shot at me. Like, I'll, if I, when I visit with teams, I'll do the medicals. Um, but it was, it, it went beyond Caleb. You know, you you really felt like a sea change with all these top quarterbacks. And that, to me, feels a little bit different. Now, that's certainly not um, grabbing your power uh, on the scale of, you know, demanding a trade or asking for equity, which is a huge facet of the story, or, yeah. um, you know, questioning the rookie wage scale. But it is a small revolution, nonetheless, and one that every single personnel person at the Combine agent who I talked to didn't really have a case for why they shouldn't do it this way. 
Archie Manning a long time ago did this for Eli Manning and wasn't protective father, was quarterback who wasn't protected as a player when he played in New Orleans and was great and understood how much the body would hurt and was trying to protect his son from ending up with a bad team. I uh, enjoyed at the very end... After LeBron James did all the things he did, Tom Brady looking up and saying, wait a minute, I have real power. I don't have to be under the thumb of the Patriot way. It probably took him about 15 to 16 years before he realized it. So, of course, all of this would trickle down in sports to Aaron Rodgers realizing at about 38 or 39, if I go to the Jets, I'm my own economy. I'm my own value system. I should ask for ownership. Of course, it's rejected. I think most sports fans don't think of the draft as un-American, the the rookie wage scale as un-American, as freedom inhibiting. I think they're so normalized that what will happen is that Caleb Williams and his father will be demonized for trying to shake the system up. They will be like Uncle Dennis was for Kawhi Leonard in asking for the world when he went to the Clippers. So the Uncle Dennis part is a fun, I didn't make that connection before, but yes, there is something to the idea of a, of a, a, essentially a guardian being the bad guy here. And it, the Uncle Dennis story, Vita, it also in the doing of that uh, saga, it kind of took agency away from Kawhi Leonard. Like, that was the story. Yeah. It's like, Uncle Dennis is doing all... He's this, like, wizard behind the scenes. He's, like, making all these demands. Can I get courtside seats? Can I get equity? And part of what this reporting athletic is suggesting is that actually, like, maybe a story inside of the story is how much Caleb Williams does or doesn't want any of this. And so the question about equity, which you'd referenced, about, like, look, in July, right, there was this story in Sports Business Journal that reported that NFL owners had just voted to prohibit, quote, non-family employees from taking equity in teams, end quote. And the reason why is because, per the athletics reporting, Carl Williams, Caleb's dad, was broaching the topic with agents, really like trying to get... The reason, in fact, Caleb, it seems, didn't hire an agent is because the family, the camp, it's hard to dis disentangle them for now, um, they were saying, hey, could you find a way to get us out of the rookie wage scale? Like, yeah. can you actually find loopholes? And no, uh, so they didn't hire an agent, which is, you know, again, savvy if nothing else. Does he need to pay someone, what are they, it's 2 to 5%, I can't remember, for the, the players now, to negotiate a deal that's already set in stone? It doesn't, I mean, like, that to me makes the most sense out of any of this. Although, uh, when you go against the agents, and, and we saw this with Lamar Jackson, we've seen this at, with other players who have chosen to represent themselves, because the agents talk to reporters, uh, that means that yes. your way of doing things will be questioned. Um, okay, so as far as the demonization, which Dan talked about, I think it's worth separating two things here. One is the idea of Caleb Williams or any other player rejecting the draft. And it's very easy to see why fans would not like that. Um, because fans, your reward for your team sucking is that you get Caleb Williams or whatever, right? So any player who questions that sort of order of things, there's a logic to it that I understand. You can say oh, there's other, uh, you know, it's, it's pocket watching, it's disempowering, you're siding with owners, whatever. But I think from a pure football perspective, I can understand why there's some tension there between NFL fans and uh, players, rookies, rookies' families. Sure. The equity thing is different, though. So the equity story, and I believe Kalen reported that Aaron Rodgers' cam also, it yep. was rumored to ask about this. Um, that resurfaced during the season, even though it, the story came out last July. During the season, at some point, the aggregators, one of the ag terrible aggregator accounts, resurfaced it, and it went viral, and people got really mad at Caleb Williams all over again, even though it's unclear what he actually asked for what his family asked for, whether it was just asking questions or how serious the inquiry was. That, to me, um, is something that fans should not be upset about. That That is siding with billionaires over millionaires, and it has nothing to do with your football team. And it's also something that players should, quarterbacks in particular, should ask for. 
I mean, we this morning, Dan and I were talking about a team, the Denver Broncos, who traded away the farm and paid 245, uh, signed a $245 because they were so desperate for a quarterback. And then now, so desperate to move on from that quarterback, they're absorbing $85 million in dead money. That is how important this position is to your franchise, to the team, to the business of it. Why should that position in particular not partake in the long-term success of the franchise? No good explanations to me. I got to think that the grand majority of people listening to this, if I told them, here's the deal, you're coming out of college and you're the most valuable person in the universe at this occupation, do you think you should go to the city of someone else's choosing and your leverage means nothing because your salary is slotted? Nobody listening to this would want that situation for themselves. The only time right now that Caleb Williams could shake up the system is is by him and his father asking all the questions right now about why do we have to do it this way when if my son simply went to a sport that didn't have a salary cap. People like Jerry Jones and Dan Snyder fighting over needing a quarterback would go through the roof to pay that person uh, a a value that they would assign and then rich people uh, would fight uh, with each other over seeing who could get that quarterback. The salary cap to me is simply... uh, there because owners know they can't control themselves and Caleb Williams and his dad should try to get anything and everything they want, but they're not going to get any of what they want. What's going to happen is they're going to get frustrated by this system because I'm not sure that they come from uh, where it is that Archie Manning would come from, which is a lifetime of being able to protect his child's money with his own wealth. I do think the moment at which you sign the paperwork is the moment at which you lose power, right? That's kind of the recognition here. Like, why is the combine this pivotal moment, Mina? It's because as soon as they sign that rookie deal, you have literally legally relinquished your right to negotiate in the ways that any sort of person would want to use the power of competition to pit various employers against each other, to try and get the best deal for yourself. All of the stuff that Carl... So basically, Carl Williams has been framed as largely a quack in ways that, of course, anonymous people who leak to agents would like to make him out to be because he's not hiring an agent and he's coming for the very status quo that they profit off of. So that to me is not in much dispute. Like, what is the incentive here? What's so interesting, though, what's really interesting to me, though, is that you now have this generation of guys, because it's beyond Caleb Williams, as Mina said, this generation of guys who are seeing the audition as not their audition, but teams auditioning for them. Like, prove to me that you're the place that I should go as opposed to, again, I'm nervously cramming for this test because I got to figure out what my IQ is going to be on record here and my bench and my 40 time. That just seems to be this change that seems like it won't stop changing unless you saw what, what, why are you shaking your head there? I, well, I think it's less about, because none of these guys are going to try to control where they end up. Let's be real. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Like, this is not going to happen. Uh, I, I would be shocked. But what they are doing is trying to control the process to maximize their earnings, where they do end up uh, to get yes. drafted higher, right? Um, you know, like, for example, a player like Jane Daniels, who's excellent quarterback prospect, rising up, now pushing for number two in the draft. Two makes more than number three. It's a big deal. Uh, he's really thin. And that's a big question mark around him is his build. And so him saying, yeah, I'm not going to weigh in at the combine. I'm going to weigh in at the pro day. Uh, is him saying, I am going to control when you see how heavy I am. For example, I'm just using that as an example. Um, basically, it's it's less them saying, hey, all of you teams have to, you know, I'm the employer here. I'm the hirer and all you teams have to come to me. It's more saying, okay, you're the hirers, you're all my potential hirers, but you're only going to see, I'm only going to take the ACT instead of the SAT to use. uh, The nerdiest possible example that resonates fully with me personally. But but it's saying like, you're not going to get all the information you want. I'm going to control because I want to put forward the best possible case for myself. But even that little act of saying, you, you only will get to see X, Y, and Z, that is different from previous years when there was more desperation 
or at least it felt like uh, more control on the part of the employers. It's such an interesting tension, though, because you know, Mina, and you know this too, Pablo, the the entire football establishment has, maybe it's changed some in recent generations, but my entire lifetime, it's about we control you. We control every aspect of your contract, of your freedom, of your structure. Uh, You can do some things when you go home on your own, but we've got control control over you and what it feels like now, a different generation of players who have seen athletes buck on that system, is they want some of that control back. But none of this is going to change, right? Caleb and Carl are, are, I mean, you called Carl a quack for having perfectly reasonable ideas about freedoms his son should have. Quoting, quoting someone else, calling him a quack, to be clear no, here. No, I'm not. I'm just saying, just, but I'm saying that I, I, but Carl, yes. Carl is being dismissed. They are being dismissed Correct. because everyone's used to, of course, yeah. the football team gets control. And I'm asking, how much more control would you like football teams to have? <laughs> they already have plenty. Dan, that's what I love about this story because uh, he was, he has been portrayed to me in the press the combine as, you know, stage dad, over-involved, wow, how crazy it is that he's demanding this. But if you took this athletic article, which kind of outlines the actual things that uh, his Caleb Williams dad has asked about, not even like demanded, but just kind of inquired about, um, and you presented all of those things to anyone outside of our sport, I think to a man, they would all agree this is eminently reasonable. Oh, you have... Imagine this was like the tech industry and your son was like, you know, the had, I don't know, invented some sort of product that every company wanted. And if you were going to all these companies, your Facebooks, your Twitters, and you said, yeah, he would like equity. He would like some control over his contract. He doesn't want to go through your song and dance. Nobody would question any of that. Uh, And it's one of those things where, like, when you step outside of football, you see how wild it is, the process. Yes. Uh, And, but, you know, it is presented as being anything but. Well, it is funny, right? Like, the idea that in scouting, you're trying to basically psychoanalyze all of these uh, prospects you might pay nine figures to. And the trait that Caleb Williams and his family are exhibiting is an extraordinarily... um, detailed and sophisticated understanding of how they're trying to attack a defense right now. The defense just happens to be the institutional status quo of the sport itself as opposed to, you know, uh, the linebacker lining up across from him. How about the institution of fatherhood? Because uh, when she says to a man, any father with that child would want these freedoms we're talking about. Like, there's, you will get no yeah. disagreement from a single father that loves his child. All right. This was a similar uh, discussion around Lamar Jackson and his mom, his mom, right? Mom, right? Yeah. Can you, uh, can you, yeah. Can you imagine? Let's say Mina's kid is an NFL prospect. What Mina is like at these, like, what kind of stage mom are you going to be for your offensive tackle? Offensive lineman. Uh, I mean, you know. I'm such a rules follower. You know that. <laughs> and she Come loves on, the NFL. She here? and she loves the NFL about as much as she loves Nino. So she might side with the NFL. Come on, Nino. We're gonna comply, right? We can get along. We can Just run the forty. <laughs> run the forty. Come on. <laughs> Should we go to saying no because that feels like a segue? Sure. Can't say no. Um, my story is not about sports. Although I guess it is, in a way, coming off of the story, there is a little bit of resonance uh, when you think about it. Uh, it's about saying no, right? And yeah, I guess. Uh, it's, it's the two articles that I both sent you both came out around the same time, which is kind of funny. Um, one, the one that caught my eye, First was by Leslie Jameson, who's a nonfiction writer. I really love, by the way, it's a beautiful writer. Uh, in the New York Times, it's called The Mind-Boggling Simplicity of Learning to Say No. Uh, the other article was in The Atlantic, uh, also about the same topic. It says, overwhelmed, just say no. This one's by Arthur C. Brooks. 
pretty similar. Both articles talk about the reasons why people have trouble saying no. And both articles give some practical tips for those who want to get better at saying no. Uh, and there's some overlap in the tips as well. Um, just to kind of summarize the reasons, though, I thought this was an interesting kind of diff the reasons they arrived at were a little bit different. The Atlantic story um, talks about two things. One, not valuing the future with present. So that really is more like a time management, which is something we've talked about, about aspect of saying no, basically being like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I can do this in the future, not really considering what that means for your schedule. And then the other one is sort of future FOMO, like the fear of regret. If you say no to something, opportunity, friendship, uh, meetup, whatever, you will regret it in the future. Uh, Leslie Jameson's piece uh, brought, brings up a different reason why people say no. She talks about how it resonates with women in particular, but perhaps you guys will identify with this too, which is sort of like the fear of offending people or hurting someone's feelings. Although yes. she's a very, very good she, she characterizes it not as an unselfish act, but actually selfish one, which is you want people to think you're a good person. You want to, you don't want to lose like social equity. Can I just jump in on that? The thing about how you don't say no, or I don't say no often, because I don't want the other person to feel bad. Um, it's a problem with me to the point where I have been in conversations where the impulse to protect someone from my perception of their humiliation is such that I will not correct people about things that are absolutely wrong about me. I will just go along with it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you misheard me saying that like Dune is the worst movie of all time. Now I'm locked into this take. Because if I were to say <laughs> 10 seconds in that actually you've been wrong for 10 seconds, I feel like that would shatter you as a person. So I'm going to just eat this for the rest of this conversation. It, okay, I just want to tell you this. I love the our caretaker we've hired to help me out with our child, his nanny. Uh, every day she has all these, she gets books from the library. She has a book that she's been reading to him for about two weeks now. It's been in our home. And every time I walk by, she points to it and she it makes noises and talks. And she's like, yeah, see, he's learning Korean because I'm Korean. The book is Chinese. And I can't <laughs> figure out how to explain to her. Explore, that is ex <laughs> that one is million Korean. perfect <laughs> example. Perfect example. Just, I don't, I've actually had conversations. I'm like, Nick, should I tell her at some point? Because it's gone on for so long now that I feel like it's too late for me to say anything. <laughs> now you have to learn about China You're in for the follow-up conversations. It has a panda on the cover. Come on. Come on, man. Are, it's a panda. I don't have trouble with no this way. And I don't you know. Don't. It wasn't hand me down in any way, and I don't know that it was something that I saw very much of. I think, Pablo, so it sounds like for you and me, we both share this, and it's much more about the social dynamic than it is about time management or the fear of missing out on something. Is that my correct in yeah, diagnosing yeah, yeah. us? I, I feel uncomfortable when someone else feels uncomfortable. It's, it's, same, um, same. It's a, it, like, not to make myself into a hero. But uh, I feel the pain of others, Dan. And so I, I guess I'm just better at being a person. <laughs> uh, you guys are afflicted with something here that I don't believe uh, that I don't think of you as both uh, having a great deal of trouble with boundaries, uh, generally speaking. So this is a very specific type of boundary that is being crossed because you're not setting it. And I don't think of it as either one of you. I don't think either one of you have trouble in other areas areas with the setting of boundaries. This is a very specific one that involves uh, a, another person coming to you and asking for something and you unable to say no, as opposed to you setting it firmly because there's not a request being made or wherever it is that someone else would send, wherever the other places are that you would set boundaries. I just don't want to make them feel bad. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess it just hurts less to do it as opposed to watch someone process me saying um actually this idea and this is my translation of what the word no is um what a fucking stupid idea never bring this to me again and i'm like oh that seems harsh even though i've just said no period um that's my translation of it okay i actually thought these tips were really good um one of them was both of these articles had the same tip which is you have to document 
your nose. Uh, both of them wrote them down or, in the case of the Atlantic writer, shared them with a friend. Basically, like if you say no to something, let's say your husband knows or you, you have a friend who shares, perhaps Pablo and I could be in a no society, a no club. Um, you tell someone, you say, hey, I said no to something today. And you become then more inclined to do so knowing that you have some kind of accountability or in this case, reverse accountability for doing it. Um, the Atlantic writer also talks about like viewing it as an like saying yes as not the default, being like an opt-in sort of mentality. Uh, right. And then the other thing, and I thought this was also very helpful, waiting a day before saying yes, give, making giving yourself some time before you say yes makes you less likely to do so. It just resolves um, itself by me never actually answering yeah, them, which is why I have 15,000 unread emails right now from various college students that I will get to because I care about the future of journalism in America. What is the worst thing you've ever said yes to <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> for fear of... <laughs> Not, you know what I mean, for fear of events. Well, but here, here, so, here's what happens. Here's what you run. Oh, here's what question. you guys well, end up running it. into if you don't say no. Because I learned this. Uh, this was something that I learned with Stugatz and a friend of Stugatz who came by the studio one day, and uh, with with his family. This person spent about an hour taking pictures with me, with everybody else. It wasn't just a quick in and out thing. Just kept making requests, kept making requests. And I didn't say no until he said, where's your father? Can I take your some pictures with your father? And I'm like, my father didn't come in today. He's not here today. And, and then the, the request was, can you ask him to come in? No. Yes. No, that oh was my the, God. And, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to ask him to come in. And that's where I drew the line. But then I went to Stugatz and I told him the story. And you know what Stugatz's reaction was? Yeah, buddy, you keep asking. You just keep asking for stuff until someone says no. There's no shame <laughs> in just keep asking for stuff because you'll keep getting stuff if you keep asking for stuff. And that's where you guys both get trampled if you don't say no. Dan telling that story reminds me of one of my favorite yeses, which is to say the worst yes that I can recall right now, which is a call I was on with uh, Charlie Kravitz, our mutual friend, um, and Stu Gotts. Because Tugats was pitching me during the pandemic on somehow, I don't even know if Dan knows about this, maybe he knows all of it. Stugatz pitched me on co-hosting a show with him called Stick to Sports. And I said I would get on the call with him because I didn't know where this was headed. And the show involved me and Stugatz giving takes and then also wearing Velcro suits with a Velcro wall. So that after we give the take, we literally have to jump at the wall and stick to sports. No. <laughs> this call was like 45 Wait. minutes. Like, it wasn't Has like, ha, 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 second take? this is stupid. Let's stop Has this. It was, wait, what, what, was, what was the second take one? Has he ever pitched you on second take? Oh, what's that? You Oh, ooh, awkward. He's never pitched you on second take. Uh, it is exactly what it sounds like, Pablo. <laughs> I got the first draft of second first take. Wait, I got Stu got to workshop his <laughs> idea with me and then came to you with the more evolved version after I gave my <laughs> notes on this. Not I that. seriously engaged him with this for 45 minutes. You gave him notes? We second should, take was pre-pandemic, so we should put oh, up God. on the oh, oh, I was I was the I was the safety school. I was Dugatz's terrible cheating on Dan sports show safety school. I didn't know any of this. Not surprising. <laughs> I, I've told you guys before that I am William H. Macy in Boogie Nights. I show up all the time and there is my uh, marital partner in the driveway uh, having uh, sensual relations about sticking to sports and second takes. Uh, he... Uh, is all of the things that we say he is, but I did not know that his idea, David Letterman, we can show this was done a long time ago, David Letterman jumping off of a trampoline and sticking to something as Velcro. Could we have the trampoline up? Now this wall is again covered with uh, the, the other half of the Velcro, right? <laughs> all right. But it's the only idea he had. He just has the funny visual of sticking to something and then he'll build it out from there. But there's only there's not much of an idea there other than the funny thing of I, I, I don't know what you're going to do the second week of shows once it's These sort were of run most its of course. my notes. 
These were most of my notes. And let me just tell you something. As I, <laughs> as I expect Mina to give us, by the way, the worst yes she's ever given. Um, what I was trying to do, imagine how ineffective it is for me to gently try and get Stugatz to back off of this premise when all he has is the premise and all he has is the instinct to keep forcing it down my throat. That's why the call was 45 minutes. The thing about Stu Gatz, though, is when you say yes to him, you do so knowing that it probably won't go anywhere. So I actually feel comfortable just saying, yeah, sure, yeah, definitely. Send me a proposal, knowing the proposal will never come, right? Like, so the, actually, it, it's not as... The, the the asks are not, except for the thing I did for his book, but typically <laughs> the asks... Well, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, because that book. took many years oh, of him not you, doing anything, you, and then eventually what ended fool. up happening is a, an assortment yeah. of people did it for him, and That's you true. ended up during the Super Bowl writing more for his book than he will write for his book. That's a thing that happened. It's accurate. And, and every... Real thing. Yeah, well, but this is... The, I just got done telling you the story. He will keep asking, and every once in a while, you're going to get backed people. into a corner, and you're going to end up writing his book for him. My worst yeses, unsurprisingly, being a woman, are all dates. All throughout my life, just dates that I didn't want to go on, that I knew I didn't want to go on. <laughs> no. And, you know, actually, this brings me back to the article, because the the... Leslie Jameson's story starts with her complaining to her father about being asked to basically do overtime at a job, at bakery or something. And her father says something that she, it really resonates with her, which is that person has every right to ask and you have every right to say no. And that the people, the per when you're reluctant to say no, you bear some responsibility for the interaction. And when I think back to some of the dates that I went on, in a way, like, if you know, I, I certainly made it worse by saying yes, knowing that it wasn't going anywhere. Now, I do think that ignores the fact that some people could be quite pushy um, and relentless, not just about dates, obviously, but about anything. But, but that, that I think stuck with me a little bit, which is that when you are a relent, like when, when you are a person who constantly says yes, you do bear a lot of responsibility for what follows. Not to, not to plumb the depths of your traumas. But is there a date where you were like very quickly of the understanding this was a terrible yes to give? It's not a good story. It paints me in a horrible light. But <laughs> I, I guess Dan... Yeah, I can't believe I'm telling this like joy. Uh, there's a guy that he, in his picture for the, it was like a pre-app stage of the internet. He was kind of like being like, What's happening? Here we the, go. For the, for like, the, you, oh, he was God. Like kind of hiding behind his... <laughs> he was coily hiding behind what? What's your hand uh, standing yeah. for? For he his actual kind of hand? Like... So Like a mind? I met up with him. Public place. Bright of day. Yeah, I was kind of like, I don't even know how to phrase it. Anyways, he, he had an eye patch in real life, but you couldn't see it in the photo. And, and, and that, that, that explains you know, some things in retrospect, I bring doesn't it? it? I met up with him, and you know, it's like okay, you know, I was a little bit surprised, you know, <laughs> wait, wait, very successful, I mean, good-looking man. Look, look, I don't know how you telegraph to somebody that you're trying to hide something. something he was, but, okay, now he was, gonna... he was standing behind. He was standing behind a wall. <laughs> oh, no. Here, here. Like Shaq behind mine, that tree, that meme. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so let me bring, I need to get to the conclusion of the story because it's what rescues me from being the horrible person in this story. So far, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be rescued, just as a side note. But I don't think you're horrible, though. He's starting with a dishonesty. Thank you. We meet for coffee. He's kind of mean. Um, and we're walking around <laughs> the East Village. And we pass a girl I know who's sitting outside with her husband. And I'm like, oh, hi, this is person's name. I, I'm not like, we just were on our first internet date. We walk away. He looks at me. <laughs> with his, his. And he looks at me and he goes, your friend has a lot of hair on her face. Oh, no. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> sir. <laughs> sir, not all of us are as good at covering the S things on sir. our face with our hand as you are. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Anyways, I shouldn't have said yes to that. I knew I, something was weird. I knew something was weird, but I went along with it anyways. And to my credit, I said no to a follow-up. I mean, of course that guy was mean. He's got the seething resentment of unsuccessfully trying to hide that he's got one eye from, 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 from women he's trying to trick. I still feel bad about it to this day, even though I was not in the wrong. So bad. So what should I say to my nanny, though? Real talk. Yeah, I think you should say... Um, it's too late. It's too late. You've lived the lie for too long. Like, you're gonna... <laughs> you, you just gotta become Chinese now. Dan, what you got for us, buddy? This is an article from The Atlantic, How Happy Couples Argue. They don't try to control each other. They try to control themselves. It is by Derek Thompson. The reason that I uh, wanted to bring it in front of you is at least in part because I've just learned a great deal over, I don't know, all the time I've been with Valerie, uh, who sort of upended the way that I have done things all of my life. At one point in my life, I was someone who uh, was in relationships and would be proud to say something along the lines of, we don't argue, uh, which doesn't seem uh, like a terribly bad thing on its face. But when I did talk to my therapist about this, uh, one of the things that she said is like, that's not probably the most human way to go through these things. And so I have uh, learned how to argue better, but I follow or I fall into some of the same patterns and traps sometimes where I have to be self-aware about things that I have done because I'm not quite formed, but these patterns are, are deeply entrenched. And so I just wanted to talk to you guys about how it is that you argue because I've done a lot of learning on, uh, on this front and and I, I now have sort of a voice inside of me that tells me I'm doing that thing while I'm doing it. So I know how to, uh, I know how to eject from some of my bad patterns. I just want to point out that Mina and I simultaneously started making roughly the same face, but her face was more conspicuous. So I want to see what she's thinking no. about. I, 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 me? I, I, no. <laughs> 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 judging you? What? <laughs> Not judging you at all. Um, I, I I like this article a lot. I mean, it really, the conclusion is basically like the way you argue is more important than what you argue about in terms of like, you know, healthy relationships. I think that's absolutely true. That's something that I have found to be true uh, in my own relationship. Uh, and I was smiling actually not because of what Dan said, but because I was thinking of something that... Um, occurred to me recently, which is I have found that the way I argue in my marriage is exactly how I argue on the show first take. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is to say, um, and and in I I think success correlates with the same patterns for both, not getting overly emotional in the moment presenting a uh, neutral to smiling facade as much as possible, <laughs> not raising my voice, leaning on facts, uh, not trying to make the other person feel small uh, and acknowledging what they've said. I, I try to do both of those things and I find that both in both cases, it works best for me. I, uh, I relate to that in the sense that Liz has accused me at my worst. Because we've established on the show previously, I don't really yell, I don't raise my voice. But I do tend to lapse into a debate mode if I am, mm. like, really convicted about something. And Liz has called me out for this. I did high school debate, uh, obviously, gas bag on sports television. And it, it just snaps me back into the reality of, like, oh, right. Um, the person I'm trying to convince is not an audience, a third-party judge. It's the person I'm talking to. Yeah. And as soon as she says it, I'm like, oh, f <laughs> Like, so much of this article that hit to the core of me was about how, um, and this is specifically something that I relate to, about how oftentimes uh, men, uh, me, uh, will try to solve a problem, like dissect it, analyze, provide a solution same. to it. I, yeah, that's I have uh, the same problem. Yes, because I'm like here to be solutions oriented, be constructive with my uh, argumentation, let's say. And a lot of it, 
I've learned over years and years, and also this single paragraph at the very top of uh, Derek uh, Thompson's story, um, people just want to have their emotions expressed and confirmed yeah. so that they fundamentally feel like they're not alone processing this. And that to me, I just skip that part in my brain so often to that, like, how that, can I fix this? Yeah, that's as that's, opposed to how can I just sit with this? I want to read this to you guys. In his new book, Super Communicators, the journalist Charles Duhigg writes that one of the most common sources of conflicts in relationships is when partners don't agree on the type of conversation they're having. Some conversations are practical. Let's solve a problem together. Others are emotional. Let's talk about it and understand our feelings. Many fights mistake practical for emotional conversations and vice versa. Versa. Well, I think actually both my husband and I are default to you want you oh you, you brought this to me you want my advice you want me to fix it and to Pablo's point is often not what the other person wants. Um, something I've started doing started over the last few years is almost at the very beginning I try to suss out okay what do you want me to do like what what are we doing here I think setting the terms of and this is kind of what the article gets at what the goal is of the conversation really, I've found to be really helpful in making that conversation. Are we venting? Are we venting or fixing? Like, are, are, do you just need to be heard here or Man, do you want? Yeah. I underestimated so stupidly the value of venting. Just like sometimes you just want someone else to be there as you relay what happened to you that day. And in fact, I've been informed reliably by sources close to the situation. Um, when you jump in with your thoughts, you're like just getting in the way of them feeling and literally being heard. And it's just the fact that lots of people do this it makes me feel somewhat better. Also worse, though, because it's just a cliche. Like I, 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 I just realized um, in the course of reading these articles that, oh, yeah, I, I am. I am a stand up comic cliche. Men do this and women do this. I'm telling you, I'm like, okay, let me just jump in here. A lot of women I know are fixers and have the exact same problem. So it's not a cliche. It, it's not, so I, I actually don't cliche. think it's gendered at all. So now you're being a cliche because you're trying to associate this with, with male hot. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> We're cut no, I, I think if anything, it's, it's a type A quality which is not mm. particularly gendered. It's unsurprising to me that all three of us, while maybe we have different attitudes or relationships with the word no, are similarly annoying. <laughs> uh, I believe we have solutions. Let's put it that way. I do find some of this to be particularly tricky, though, like because I really I have had to learn it uh, because there's an inner voice wherever it is that I feel the deepest forms of love. I'm with someone I trust so implicitly who's not really ever looking to argue with me gratuitously that generally speaking, I now know, and this is um, a fairly amazing thing to realize at my age, I now know if we're arguing, I've probably done something wrong that I'm not yet aware of that's about to reveal itself. I mean, if it's not about some silly thing, it's it, because she's not she's not looking for the places where she can win an argument with me. And she's so consistently loving about everything that I just trust it now. There has uh, a, an introspection has been forced upon my blind spots that just wasn't there before. I do like that one of the things you said before, Dan, as you go through your journey of uh, perpetual self-discovery, uh, is that your therapist was like, you should, you should fight more. What are you repressing, right? If you're never arguing, like it doesn't seem, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are many couples that get along so harmoniously that it's just not, you don't have to do it. But it doesn't work for me is what she was saying. This was specific to me. I don't think she was saying in general, couples should never argue. She was talking, right, 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 right. She, she's done analysis like I've done, I've done both. I've done therapy with my wife. I've done therapy with myself because I want, I, I want the tools that I need to learn the things that I need to learn about all of the things that I don't know that I thought I knew and have, uh, you know, have really been turned upside down. And so it was specific to me mm. that, Dan, if you're not having, if you specifically aren't having occasional conflicts with people, you're not doing it right. So I was listening to that. I think my husband and I don't fight very much. Like the fact that we don't fight very much, comedy. 
that's the word I was, I was searching for, is also like a real privilege. Uh, alluded earlier to the fact that, you know, we have a nanny who's in the other room who, who, who works, you know, during the week. Who thinks you're Chinese. <laughs> And that's fine because my, my infant uh, pooped all over the crib <laughs> this morning. Point is, the closest we come to fighting every week is on Saturdays when it's just us because you are pushed to the limit by a child. Um, money buys peace, y'all. Like, uh, yeah. the yep. fact that we, yeah, like, um, I only have to. Uh, make those decisions as little as I do is something that I have purchased in my own life. And I, something that has occurred to me, Pablo, is if that wasn't the case, oh my God, life would be much more full of tension. Obviously, money helps with those things. And I'm here to tell you that not having kids helps with those things. Because if you have not slept and are irritable, like there is all sorts of shrapnel and ancillary stuff that can make an appearance that has almost nothing to do with your relationship. I am definitely the special teams coach of my household. Like Liz has all of the other jobs, basically. Um, and I need her to do that. And my frustrations often when I lapse into debate mode are about how I fear, I feel at least, um, that she doesn't necessarily take seriously the job that I have, which is why I'm stressed, which is why she needs to do that stuff, because I need to do a show with my friends about how I'm a f enlightened person now and she's getting in the way right now with her complaints about how i'm not enlightened enough uh, none of like us none of us take exact same thing none of us take you seriously pablo and uh, liz is raising two toddlers it's two toddlers she's married <laughs> to one of them and only one of us on the bed recently so <laughs> What did we find out today as I try to get both of you back to your families and me to mine at the end here? I found out that Stugatz had two other scams he was trying to <laughs> uh, execute with two other of my friends. I'll add it to the library list. It is many stories high of all the things Stugatz has done to try and find the thing that can allow him to exist away from me. Yes. I found out that Pablo will never say no to me if I ask him for stuff. So I should start asking you for stuff more often. Oh God. I I resent I resent the fact that I most related to Mina. I found out today that I most related to Mina being unable to push back on someone uh miscasting her country of origin. I was like, Yep, been there. I have been in so I, many even, Ubers where I'm just like, Yep, I'm Hispanic, dude. You got me. When you brought up Too the late story now. for the second time, I started whispering because of <laughs> proximity. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want her to know. You're like, how can I tell her? And I'm thinking, Mina, just say it a little louder into the microphone. She's in should the other room. I, <laughs> should I suggest she listen to this podcast, which definitely yes. will never happen? S send her this link. Send her She's this 58. link. 58. Send it with Chinese We're a subtitles. Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> what, what if I buy a Korean book? Okay, Mina just put her hand to her mouth like like a one-eyed one-eyed catfisher. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mina's uh, trying to trick a man that she wants to date into thinking she has a nose. <laughs> But as for our locker room here, because we run a tight ship here at Pablo Torre, finds out. And our team includes Michael Antonucci, Ryan Cortez, Sam Daywig, Juan Galindo, Patrick Kim, Neely Lohman, Rachel Miller Howard, Ethan Schreier, Carl Scott, Matt Sullivan, Chris Tuminello, and Juliet Warren. Our studio engineering by RG Systems, our post production by NGW Post, our theme song, as always, by John Bravo. And yeah, we will uh, talk to you on Tuesday with yet another very different episode.